Beloved community, grace and peace to you from the God who is our refuge and our strength. Whether you are part of First Church, an inclusive and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a guest or friend joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship on this Stewardship Sunday as we launch a new theme. Because of you, our church changes lives. In a world of hatred, here we choose love. In a time of war, here we choose peace. Amidst endless cycles of blame, here we choose to bless. In a world of vengeance, here we choose grace. In a sea of loneliness, here we worship to draw near to God and to one another. Our church changes lives, including our own. So however you might be showing up today, however you might be feeling this morning in this hour of worship, may God's generous grace wash over you. Today we are grateful to welcome the Reverend Karen Byrne as our preacher. Karen is not only an active member of our community, but previously served on our pastoral staff. Please learn more about her by reading the bio that is included in your worship folder. We also welcome back Dennis Turner as our musician while Leela is away on vacation. Thank you, Dennis, for your gift of music that has already begun to bless us. Following worship, all are invited to join us in the narthex for fellowship and coffee, followed by a sermon talk back with Reverend Karen up in the chapel and on Zoom. Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here into this shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. So let us worship together, beginning with our opening hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. That's number 28 in your New Century hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit.
Good morning. Let's pray. Oh God, we confess the heavy yoke we place on ourselves through insecurity and pride. When we believe our joy depends only on ourselves, our fence clench in fear of scarcity. Forgive us. Invite us once more into a deeper joy. Call us to lay down our self-imposed burdens that we might freely give ourselves to your vision of a beloved community. Amen. Beloved community, hear the good news made known in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. My name is Reverend Sam. I'm the um, associate minister here, and I'd love to welcome the children and youth to join me on the chancel here for a children's moment. Um, oh my goodness. Thank you, Natalie and Laura and Brendan and Greta and Barrett and MJ and Jesse and Woodrow and Wallace, we are all here. And it brings delight to me to see all of you. You're going to come on up, Wallace. We'd love to see you. And guess who's also here? It's Bear. Can everyone say hi to Bear? Hello, boys and girls. Now, Bear and I were talking the other day. Because remember, a couple Sunday schools around, Bear participated in Sunday school, and everyone said hi to Bear. You know what, boys and girls, that made me feel so loved and welcome. Because of you, I felt loved and welcome. Can you imagine that you have that power to make people feel good inside, like you all made Bear feel good inside? But what I want to talk about today is we are going into a season at the church called Stewardship, which is a thank you to everyone here from making the church what it is today, okay? And the theme of the church is because of you, the church makes a difference. And I was wondering if you all could hold your hand, if we can look around and if we can see examples of ways we can make a difference. Let's see if we can start over here. What is Nikki holding up? Serving others. We serve others in so many ways through the drop-in center and Tommy's pantry and service trips. Karen's holding, we work for peace. Amen to that. We need more of that. Meg is holding, do justice. Um, Andrew's holding it. Welcome extravagantly. Make sure everyone here feels welcome and a sense of belonging. We offer comfort and support to wherever you are. 
CJ is holding up teaching our children and our youth. Nick is holding up build beloved community. And Lucille is holding up, we see Lucille over there, she's holding up worship and sing together. Oh my goodness. And you know what's amazing about this? These are little things that we can do by ourselves, at home, whatever. But when we come together, the Spirit gathers us. So if you are holding a sign, I was wondering if you could come and join us, and we can all make a circle, and we are going to see if the Spirit is going to be here. Do you think we can do this? Yes, okay. So come on up. We are all going to bring your signs. I'd like everyone to stand up. We're going to make a circle. We're going to make a circle. And one of the most powerful ways, and Dennis, Dennis over there, he's going to teach you all in the next four weeks this powerful way of feeling the Spirit through song. So, so we're going to sing a song, and we're going to invite everyone to sing a song with us. And the song goes like this. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Deep in our heart, we do believe that we shall overcome someday. All right, here we go. Let's all together now. We shall overcome. connecting all of us together and with God. And with that spirit, let us welcome one another in the spirit of Christ. May the peace of God be with you. Also with you. Thank you so much, boys and girls, and thank you, helpers. Thanks. Peace, <laughs> peace Nikki. That was a wonderful day. Peace to God. Good morning. Good morning, peace. Peace, everyone. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace, Jimmers. Peace, Bob. Good to see you. Peace. Good to see you. Everybody. Peace. Peace, Kurt. Hi. Peace, Elisa. Peace. Tara, are you someplace exotic? Everybody. Peace. Peace. Peace, baby Robin. No, I'm just at home. <laughs> Wow, he has so much hair. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> Hi, Lois. <laughs> Peace. He hasn't figured out how to hit the red button, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Hi, Paul Bushmiller. Peace, Paul. Um, good morning. 
Um, I, I confess I'm feeling a little teary after that we shall overcome. It really spoke to all that I'm bringing to this service this morning, but I'm, I'm going to try to hold it together to read the scripture. Um, it's Isaiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city of ruins. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wines of rich food, filled with marrow of well-aged wines strained clear and God will destroy on this mountain the shrew, trout that is cast over all peoples the sheet that is spread over all nations God will swallow up death forever then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of people. God will take away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for this one so that God might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in God's salvation. Hear these words from Paul writing to the church in Philippi. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyk to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they've struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, 
think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I first took pledging seriously one year when the Stewardship Committee displayed in our church a large bar graph of all the pledges in the congregation. It was in the wall of the sanctuary. You couldn't miss it. The roll of paper ran maybe 20, 25 feet, and it was perhaps two, three feet high. The number of pledges were stated in specified dollar ranges. I'm remembering something like $500 ranges. And the whole span had maybe 20 bars. No names, just the number of pledges in each dollar range. There was a bell curve, as expected. I was near the bottom, not expected. I've grown accustomed to thinking myself as a pretty virtuous person. I think I probably am still liable to that train of thought. But this was a comeuppance. We were active in that church, my husband, Peter, and I, with whom I pledged jointly. And my first reaction, and I do say reaction, it wasn't a reflection was to say, well, other members probably have more income. We were new graduates just starting our careers. Other members probably had fewer obligations. We had three children, an old house, long distance travel expense to visit our family, etc. But we had no way of knowing if those comparisons were true. And even if they were, our pledge didn't reflect what that congregation meant to us. We were active consumers of everything it had to offer, everything from pastor's time to utilities. And we were committed. We felt at home there grateful for the spiritual formation we'd received, the friendships we had found. We liked identifying ourselves with what that church stood for in our community. It felt like we were counting on others to pay for what we wanted our church to be. We were spending more, way more, on discretionary expenses like eating out than we were giving to our church. We knew we could do better. We raised our pledge. And we've considered it as a serious part of our family budget ever since. That point of insight and decision, as I looked at that bar graph, so vividly remembered today was personal and private. No one told me what to do with that information. I was informed by a sense of what was true, as in this reading from Philippians. And I'd like to look at that passage and then re-examine in light of Paul's letter the moment when I found myself on that bar graph. Paul had a long-lasting, strong, and affectionate relationship with the church in Philippi. He had traveled there maybe three times. He was writing from jail it's certain that he was in jail because of references in the letter to his surroundings, although 
exactly where he was and when he was writing is unclear. But the constraints on him are evident. Even in this short excerpt, he longs for the members of the church in Philippi. He's unable to be with them. Elsewhere, the indications are clear. He was awaiting trial for a capital offense, an ominous threat that we know ended in his being beheaded. And yet the letter is also full of joy, repeated references to the overflowing love he feels for his church. The opening line in Philippians is one of the more familiar quotations in all of scripture. I thank my God every time I remember you. Financial support was an important part of their relationship in the verses following the text we heard this morning, Paul expresses gratitude for the way the Philippians had supported his work financially. He describes them as an exceptional source of financial support. You alone, you gave according to your means and even beyond your means. He describes specific members of the church who struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. They have worked together. This church was especially significant for Paul and even for us. It's the first Christian church in what we today know as Europe. Founded by him early in his ministry as he made his way from Asia Minor to Macedonia, the peninsula that we know of today as Greece. This letter is about how to live a Christian life, living in community, and love is at the core. In his first chapter, Paul says, this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best Notice that he's not telling them what to do. He doesn't take a position in the dispute between the two female leaders. He acknowledges that there is a conflict. He urges the women to be of the same mind. And he exhorts at least one other member of the church to help them do that. But he doesn't take a position. What he does do is offer a practice, a spiritual practice for decision making. Begin with rejoicing and continue always. No ambiguity, no reservations. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Gentleness is translated variously as your fairness, your magnanimity, your forbearance. Privately, let your request be made known to God. Don't worry. And then a direction to contemplate, not to act yet, but think about Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever, this is my favorite, is pleasing, whatever is commendable. It's not a boring list, but it's written with these repeated phrases of whatever is creating a wave of emphasis. And then, as if gathering up the holdouts, he broadens the invitation. If there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, he seems to ask, can your situation be so bad you can find nothing to praise? With rhetoric bordering on impatience, but landing 
firmly on the ground of assurance, he says, keep on doing what you've learned and trust that God will be with you. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Back to my moment of insight about my pathetically inadequate pledge. I find several ways that this text from Philippians describes my moment of insight. The committee that made the bold decision to post that 20-foot long bar graph in the sanctuary was in a way letting the gentleness, the fairness, the magnanimity of the community of pledgers be known to everyone. Everyone's generosity, though people were not named, was visible and I was touched by what I saw. My reflection on how to respond after that initial defensive reaction was, in contrast, a private consideration between me and my spouse, Peter. I know that we took our concern to heart, known to God. Our more serious approach to our pledge was fair. We could afford to give more. And more just, we would help to fill in for those who for whatever reason made smaller pledges. And we would lean less on those who were giving more. An increased pledge was a more honest reflection of what's important to us, the importance of that church. And lastly, to be honest, it felt right. It was pleasing. As I worked with this text, the news broke about the attack on Israel by Hamas. And my first reaction was to wonder if this litany of good things could possibly speak to our hearts in the midst of such violence and damage and danger? And how could we be patient with a mere call to think about these things? Is that adequate? My next thought was to treasure this call by Paul to remember that faith is our ground, the foundation from which we act, and our actions will be wiser and more faithful if informed by the spiritual practice that Paul recommends. Accepting the call to look for things worthy of praise does not deny that their opposites exist. On the contrary, recalling what's worthy of praise while we rejoice in the creator who empowers us, strengthens our ability to resist those things that are not worthy of our praise. Trusting in the peace of God that surpasses all understanding and will guide our hearts and minds is adequate we shall overcome. I treasure this church, churches and faith communities worldwide, as places that lead us to rejoice, to be gentle, to make our gentleness known, to pray, and to contemplate whatever is worthy of praise. In being part of that, my life has been changed, and together we'll continue to change lives. Amen.
I shall not live in vain. Thank you, choir. It's beautiful. As we come to the time in our service where we invite you to give of your tithes and offerings to support the mission of the church, I formally welcome you to stewardship season. Uh, already, we have amazing testimonies from members of our congregation on our website about how our church has changed their lives and invited them into the work of changing the lives of people outside of this space. Uh, Karen Tramontano is the chair of our stewardship committee this year. Uh, she has made so many invitations. And so if you go to our donate page, and for those of you who are on Zoom, Barry will provide that link. If you go to that donate page, you will see testimonies from Dwan Reese and Mark Jensen and Hannah Long Higgins and David Greer. And I promise you, they are deeply moving. Not only that, beginning next week, every Thursday, if you are signed up to receive all of our emails, you will receive an email in your inbox um, that will be about stewardship and some of the detailed asks that we are making for this season. Additionally, beginning next Sunday, you will hear personal testimonies spoken in worship about how our church changes lives because of all of you. So I encourage you to stay tuned, to open your heart to what God is doing in our midst. Um, you may notice that out uh, in the narthex, near the offering plate, we now have available our commitment cards for this season. It is so important to us, and Ellen's holding those up at the back, it is so important to us to receive your financial commitment. It allows us to do the planning for what 2024 will look like for us. So if you are able to let us know what your commitment is, um, anytime between now and November 19th, we will be receiving these. You can place it into the offering plate. You can mail it back to us. There's even a digital form, if you are joining us by Zoom, that can be found on our donate page. There are a lot of ways to fill this out. Next Sunday, we will have an envelope with all of your names on it that will include your stewardship letter from Karen Tramontano, a narrative budget that helps illustrate what we will do with our budget, how our budget helps us live into our shared mission, and a commitment card. So if you plan to be here next Sunday, if you're staying for our a congregational meeting, please just look in the narthex, find the letter with your name on it and take it home. If not, we will mail it to you, but you should receive one of these in the mail as well. Um, and, and let us enter into the season with joy, a season of discernment as we ask ourselves what God might be calling us to do individually, collectively, and how that will help us to, through our gifts and through God's grace, make greater justice and peace and love flow from this place into the world. Thank you all so much for your commitments, for your generosity. And we thank God who first gave to us that we might give. I now would invite you to rise and join me in the doxology.
And now let us turn to prayer. I want to begin with the prayers of the people, allowing you to give voice to whatever you might wish to share that might be on your hearts today. Joys, concerns, heartbreaks, and I'm going to invite uh, Peter, who chairs our worship commission, to take the microphone around. I see Sandy. In these times when the world is in so much turmoil and I'm kind of flailing around trying to figure out what can I do to make a difference, um, it always helps me to be reminded of the small work and the great work. And I had one of those moments yesterday, um, the Poor People's Campaign for the DMV um, got together. We huddled under a shelter at Bruce Monroe Park in the rain. Um, there were about 20 of us and um, had a lunch and, and talked together about um, the work of the Poor People's Campaign and what we could do. And, I, you know, I kind of left there thinking, well, you know, uh, that, you know, what was that all about? And, and then I realized I got that visit from the Spirit that it's about building relationships as a change point. And we were building relationships with us, um, 20 of us huddled there under the rain. So um, the small work and the great work, I'm just so grateful to be reminded of that. Thank you, Sandy. I pray for all the innocent victims in the Middle East conflict um, that seems to be spreading. And um, we can only hope that there are people who are praying hard for peace and that something will change. Thank you, Nan. I want to thank everyone for their prayers for Tom's sister, Mary Ann Mascalino. She had an extraordinarily successful heart surgery last weekend and came home the next day. Just miraculous compared to her first surgery a decade ago. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for updating us, Anne. small report card on the prayer uh, we put in for uh, my promotion. We are still reviewing the applications. Thank you. Yep, right. we'll keep praying, Raina. Uh, prayers of comfort and healing for my um, sister-in-law, Marley, and her um, husband, uh, Miles, and their extended family who lost uh, family friends in the violence this past uh, weekend in the Middle East. Happy our hearts are with your family. I'd like to offer a prayer of gratitude and expectation for the fall congregational meeting next Sunday <laughs> after worship, and a prayer of gratitude for quorum requirements that are always met because attendance is very large. Yes, not an announcement. That was a prayer request, and we, I know you will join me in praying individually even as we pray collectively. Another celebration of, of life. My father, a lot of you know Hugh Bushmiller, my dad, his sister has passed away from old age. Um, a, a good woman, uh, and I um, want to hold her family in our prayers. Yes. I want to pray for wisdom as we seek to bring the Shaw community together around a vision to create a co real community center there. Uh, there's opposition here and we need to be very wise and very forceful as we move forward. Thank you, Meg. And if people wish to speak to Meg more about that, I'm sure she's happy to talk with you about the Shaw Community Center. A few other uh, 
prayer requests I, I wish to lift up. First, I bring you greetings from the Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ, led by our conference minister, the Reverend Freeman Palmer. Um, yesterday, I had the, uh, well, not just yesterday, uh, from Thursday to Saturday, I had the opportunity to attend the annual meeting of the Central Atlantic Conference, where the Reverend Starsky Wilson served as our keynote preacher. He is the executive director of uh, the Children's Defense Fund, wonderful human being. And a lot of the focus was on children and youth, the importance of centering children and youth in our communities of worship. Um, and so I just, I bring you greetings. I give thanks for being part of the wider body and for these opportunities that we have to come together with them to be poured into. I also wish to lift up, Rose Berman asks for prayers of urgency that Arab states, especially Egypt, would open their borders to accept the Palestinian people of Gaza, treating them as human beings rather than pawns. And as we think about all that's happening in Israel and Palestine, uh, we are providing these sheets at the back. This is from the Global Ministries of the United Church of Christ. It includes a letter that was sent. The United Church of Christ signed on to this along with 27 other denominations calling for de-escalation in the Middle East. You can learn more about it. And then on the back, there are ways that you can take action. So if you want to learn more about where the United Church of Christ um, is at and, and ways that they are encouraging us to be part of the conversation and to take action, please feel free to, to take one of these. Let us pray. Oh God, so often when the world is burning, we have no words. And so we sit in the silence and listen. We lay down our defenses and face the suffering of those whose loved ones have been viciously killed or taken hostage by Hamas. Holocaust survivors and children among them. We hear the cries of those trapped in Gaza with no way out as bombs rain down. Each one, a temple not made with human hands. We face the fear and the despair of a world that cannot seem to find your peace, O oh God, of governments locked in terrible cycles of vengeance. How long, O oh Lord, must we wait for your justice to roll down, for your peace, your shalom and salam to spring up from the ground, a ground now soaked with tears and with blood. We sit in silence and listen. And yet we dare, despite our ignorance and the sins of our own government, to pray for the peace that passes all understanding, for peace in Israel, for peace in Palestine, in the Gaza Strip, for peace in Ukraine and Sudan and Haiti. We meditate on your justice, O oh God, your mercies which are new each morning. If the walls of every house of worship should crumble, let us be your holy habitation, your beating heart of love. Strengthen the weary, we pray, Lift up those brought to their knees in grief. Draw near to all in despair. Mend the broken. Heal the wounded. Wipe away every tear. Grant your courage 
to all who seek after your ways, the ways which make for peace. Together we join our voices to pray the prayer Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, Come Live in the Light, that is found in your worship folder. Before Reverend Karen offers our final blessing, I want to remind you to check our website, especially our donate page, our e-newsletter, and social media pages for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today who would like to stay connected to the life of our church and is holding up the blue cards, those visitor forms at the back, that's a way to get on our email list as well. And for those joining us on Zoom, you can click on a link that will take you to our digital visitors form. Uh, that link can be found in your worship folder. Uh, now for a few announcements. Again, please join us in the narthex for coffee and fellowship. This will be followed by a sermon talk back with Reverend Karen up in the chapel on Zoom. Um, it will be using the same Zoom call. So those joining us from Zoom just remain on the call. And next Sunday, 
as Andrew uh, is praying you, that you will join us for our fall congregational meeting that will happen after worship. There will be important conversations about our budget and the life of our church. Uh, please plan to join us for that. And then on October 29th, we have a very special All Saints worship service in which we will speak aloud for the first time the names of the enslaved laborers who worked the land on which our church now sits. Dr. Renee Harrison of Howard University School of Divinity will be our guest preacher. You don't want to miss it. And now I want to thank all who made today's service possible. Tom Sowers on sound, Barry Mills, our Zoom moderator, our liturgist, Tom McCaffrey, scripture readers, Karen Pence and Natalie Bucks, our usher team of Freda Sparks, Ellen Bushmiller and Ann Mascalino, Nyla Dixon, our Sunday morning coordinator, Peter Byrne, who set our worship table, the First Church Choir, led today by our wonderful guest musician, Dennis Turner, our Coffee Hour host, the Thayer family, and of course, our wonderful, inspiring preacher today, the Reverend Karen Byrne. Thank you. And now for our final blessing from Reverend Karen. Beloved community, I thank my God every time I remember you. Go forth, trusting that whatever you face, there are things worthy of praise, if we will but rejoice and think on them. Together, we change lives and build God's kingdom. Amen.